did a book for the people. Like this was, uh, we, we the color was hand painted uh, throughout, so there's no digital coloring in it. Uh, kept it very organic, similar to the story. And you know, this came out in this came out in 2008, and uh, I'm still talking about it. So I don't. Know, it just won't go away. Uh, the ape has since gone into the kids market, uh, so you can't buy this anywhere uh, except at my table and possibly on eBay. They went into kids, they published Sesame Street now, so this obviously doesn't look very good on their website. So about six months before this came out, I got a call from Matt Pulaski, who was producing this documentary, which I'm sure you've all seen by now. Um, called Eyes of the Mothman. Now, at any given Mothman festival, I come home with a stack of business cards of people that are making documentaries about Mothman, and no, no one ever calls back. Like, I never, nothing ever comes to fruition. But this guy called, and I drove down to Point Pleasant, and they shot me right here in the theater. And I thought, man, this, is, this looks pretty good. Like, this, this is gonna be a pretty good movie. And uh, they, they interviewed me for four or five hours. Uh, it was the most thorough experience I've ever had. And I thought, man, these guys are really serious about it. And it wound up being a really good movie. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Not because I'm in it, but it's very, very well done and very long and very, you know, it takes its time and, and tells the whole story. So I, was, I was thrilled to be a part of it. I've since turned down every other documentary because I'm just afraid that they're gonna suck. All right, so recent work, um, I went back and, uh, at about the 10 year mark in my publishing career, I realized, you know, I've got all these out of print short stories, so I thought, you know, we'll put these together and uh, just do a quick, like an anthology one off. And I wound up putting some old Mothman stuff that didn't make the Return to Point Pleasant in there. And of course, we did the variant cover just for the festival. Uh, we got, I don't know if you guys are from Ohio area, uh, I got Fritz the Night Owl involved, who was a personality on 10 TV. Um, my old employer, Gary Burbank, who was on 700 WLW, wrote the forward. Uh, this was just a total vanity, look at me project. But <laughs> I, I thought it would be fun. It, it turned out really well. Um, I, had a, I was able to uh, get rights to an old interview I had uh, done with Ray Bradbury. After he passed, I was able to get the rights to that and put that in the book. And So it's just a hodgepodge of like, everything I like. So if you're ever looking for anything cool to read, this I would recommend this one too. This one's, this one's pretty fun. So last year, uh, because of, again, just that insatiable demand on Return to Point Pleasant, we did a, a, an art book. Uh, I was going through files and I discovered that, you know, we had, we had so many covers uh, pitched for this and so many pinups and you know everybody that worked on it wanted to do a cover so this is essentially an art gallery of uh, unused covers covers we've used uh, it's got some process stuff in it like what, what it looked like in pencil like what some stuff that we couldn't use in the book looked like that we had to do alternate versions of it was just a whole uh, this is kind of a revealing of the politics this is kind of a how the sausage is made kind of book which turned out really good. I mean, there's, there's a lot of really, really talented guys on this. So again, you see like, you know, this was a, this was an alternate version of the ending, which I preferred, but uh, we had some, we had some reprint issues with that. And again, we see some behind the scenes, like on the right, you know, that's the big reveal in number two. So you get to kind of see that in the pencil form and, unused stuff this was like my favorite panel of the entire book and like once it got inked and colored it kind of lost some of the detail but like I remember writing this paragraph to the artist and like you know I want this to look like madness like all these cables coming out everywhere I want this time machine to look ridiculous that's pretty much ridiculous again this was the uh, the back cover of the original uh, this was the original version of the ending Again, we got stuck in some rights issues and I couldn't put these in the second book. 
All right, so again, a lot of you know that through the years of seeing me speak, and there, there's a running joke that uh, I always make fun of myself for, and is that in 14 years, I have been nominated for everything and won nothing. Uh, at the point I was here last year, uh, I was one for 22. So it was getting kind of frustrating, but uh, if, if any of you were here last year, you recall that I was talking about like I was going to Baltimore next weekend. I had been nominated for a couple of Harvey Awards and everything. So long story short, not to toot my own horn, but uh, I, will, I wound up winning the Comic Book Champion Award in Springfield. I swept the Harveys, uh, went to LA two weeks later and won the Geeky Award for Best Comic. And uh, also got the Comics Underground Distribution Award and was voted Best Local Author in the Cincinnati Newspaper in the course of six weeks. <laughs> this is pretty wild. So now I'm, what, six for 27. So that's pretty good. But, you know, to just constantly, you know, I, I have mentally convinced myself that the nomination is the award, which is, you know, what losers say. But now I don't have to say that. Uh, but to call this overwhelming is an understatement. Um, and uh, it was funny because like I announced a couple of these things and some some D-bag on Twitter is like, uh, said something about, well sure, it's easy to get awards for Mothman. And I'm like, none of these are for Mothman. You know, Indrid0032 or whoever the hell you are. None of these were, these were all for uh, comic related work, but obviously, but not the, not the Return of Mount Pleasant stuff. So that's what we call in my house a good month. <laughs> that was a real good month. And uh, if I can brag further, at the uh, Geeky Awards, I won my Geeky Award 20 minutes after Kevin Smith won his Geeky Award. So, same stage, same award, same everything, just 20 minutes apart. And I didn't get to meet him. So I was kind of bummed about that. But the Geeky Award is a retro laser gun on a metal base, and then the metal base has your actual, what you won for. So it's probably like the coolest award I've ever seen. So if I'm gonna win one out of you know 27, that's the one. That's the one I want in my trophy case because it it's not a pompous gold silver trophy. It's an actual ray gun. It was really interesting to. Uh, I was kind of worried when I won that. I'm like, how am I gonna get this through LAX? Like, you know, because it's it's metal and it's a it's shaped like a gun. So I was very nervous about it. And Angela, my wife, kept saying, just put it in a suitcase. Nobody's gonna care. And I was like sweating, like I was like, yeah, I really like was worried that we were gonna get trouble. And like we were standing there, and I saw the bag go through, and I looked up, and you could see it plain as day, big '50s ray gun. It was right through the scanner. Nobody gave it a second glance. So we got it home safe and sound. So that is my abridged presentation for 2016. Uh, does anybody have any questions at all? I'll be happy to answer. And if you don't ask me questions, I'm going to ask you questions. <laughs> I have questions. Yes, sir, right there. You already kind of got in trouble with the government once, right? Pardon me? You already got in trouble with the government once, right? Besides yes. <laughs> yes. That. Let, let me preface the sweating at LAX. Um, there was this time in uh, 1996 when I was on the air in a radio station in Dayton. And uh, I was filling in on a Friday, and like I didn't have my notes with me, and you know, I was new, wasn't very good at what I was doing. Well, it was the it was the anniversary of the uh, John Hinckley trying to assassinate Ronald Reagan, so I thought, well, that's topical. I'll talk about that. So I talked about that going with Cheryl Crow record, and somebody thought, as I was talking about the Cheryl Crow record, that they heard me threaten the, to kill the president, uh, which I. We didn't have a tape running, again, it was last minute. I don't know where that came from, but uh, this was at 4.30 on Friday, and about noon on Saturday, I got a, I got a buzz at the apartment. And like, nobody buzzed the apartment. Like, we were the only two people we knew in Cincinnati. I thought, Man, that's weird. And like, I hit the button, I'm like, yes. And they said, is this, uh, is this Chad Lambert? And I'm like, yes. And they said, uh, do you go by the air name Just Chad in Dayton? Yes. And they said, this is so-and-so, so-and-so from the FBI. We'd like to talk to you for a few minutes. 
I thought someone was messing with me at the station or whatever. And these were two guys from the Secret Service that came to my house and it took them almost 24 hours to find me. They went to Dayton looking for me. They found out I was in a different city. Like, it took them all day to find me. And man, did they grill me. I got, Angela and I got hammered for four hours separately. They interviewed us separately. Went through this whole ordeal. The guy said, this is an open case. Don't leave town until we've called you. Kind of thing. I, mean, I was terrified. I'd been in radio for a year. I was terrified this was the end. And uh, the guy called me like uh, four days later and he was real nice and apologetic. And he said, uh, you know, this happens a lot. You know, we just, you have to understand that we have to investigate all these things individually, just in case. I said, yes, sir, no problem. Hey guys, but can, can I give you a little bit of advice? I'm like, yeah, sure. He's like, you might want to get a different career. He said, uh, you're, you're, you're not very good. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And he goes, no, seriously, we got a couple of tapes and you, you sound like you have no idea what you're doing on the air. He said, I mentioned this to your program director as well. And I'm like, well, okay. And he goes, this is just a case of, he goes, you just kind of, you, you just stepped on your dick. And I'm like, okay, yeah, sure, okay. So I took this 15 minute critique from a Secret Service agent, knowing full well I couldn't, you know, argue my case. <laughs> So I'm like, okay, I'm the phone, whatever. And Angela was like, what was that? And I said, I think I just had an air check meeting with the Secret Service. I'm like, it was the strangest thing. So I told no one about this. They, they told me not to tell anybody, and I sure as hell wasn't going to tempt fate. I didn't even tell my parents. Like, nobody knew this story. So about six years ago, um, I had pitched this story to Dark Horse and they bought it, which never happens, ever. And the editor actually emailed me and said, do you have anything else? And the only thing I could think of was, I'm past the statute of limitations on that story. I should make a comic book about that. And I pitched it to them and they bought that one and seven others. So like, as soon as I told that one, they're like, oh, give us another radio story. I'm like, well, I can't top that one. Like, you know. I, so I wound up doing, I, I did it, I actually wound up doing four. Um, and the, the last one is coming out in March, which, you know, I just, I make fun of myself. That's the only, that's the shtick of the, of the Dark Horse pieces. But uh, the one in March, um, I was filling in for Gary one day when we were still national. And we were, we were about to go into Sports or Consequences, which was this call-in show they did from four to 4.30. And this guy comes in and they said, hey, uh, Steve so-and-so's here. He's going to hang out for Sports Consequences. I thought, oh, great, whatever. So like, we're in Sports Consequences and like, I'm hitting, the, I'm hitting the mic buttons between calls and I'm like, hey, who's that guy? And I'm like, it's Steve Coffin, it's Steve Coffin. I kept hearing Coffin. Of course, his name wasn't Coffin. But, you know, we go into sports and like, hey, we've got a racing question. Uh, you know, and you hear my earphone, go to Steve. So I'm like, Steve Coffin, what, did, what do you think of the answer to that? And he gives the answer and like somebody else calls in with another racing question and like, Steve Coffin, what do you think of that? And we did this for the entire hour. Now, does anybody know who I'm talking about by any chance that knows Kentucky racing? It was Steve Coffin, who is like the Michael Jordan of harness racing, who won the triple crown when he was 14 years old. And I had no idea who he was. So that's, that's the kind of thing that I have to, I have to supplement the, uh, the, uh, the FBI Secret Service story. <laughs> and the other thing that's funny too is um, when Gary did his last show in 2007, this was unrelated to this event. This was at an FM station in Dayton. None of these guys knew it. I, there was a retired Secret Service buddy of Gary's that was at the show that I am convinced was the guy that arrested me. But I just could not remember his name. I would have so liked to have talked to that guy 10 years later. And that's why he was so harsh on my tape. <laughs> so yeah, so whenever matters of national security come up, I'm a little tense, like trying to smuggle a laser through LAX. But yeah, good question. I love, love telling radio stories. <laughs> Anybody else? Back here. How did you end up working with Fritz? And were you a fan of Fritz back in the day? Yes, huge fan of Fritz. That's where this came from. Um, Fritz
Fritz kind of uh, came back around a few years ago and started doing the live shows and the the, the movies at the at the thing. So I'm like, man, his, Fritz is so cool. And I kept thinking, like, I, I want to put him in the comics because I know that he was in uh, Superman a few times, and him and Jerry Ordway were buddies. And so I uh, I just like I found out his real name, and like I just looked him up in the phone book and like called him. <laughs> And the idea was originally I wanted to do like a bio comic locally of his life, but you know, that was not as interesting as it sounded. Um, but I was in a comic book store and was going through this quarter bin and I found these old, you guys remember the Spidey Super Stories that were based on the electric company from the 70s? Well, they used to have this stamp on it and it was um, Morgan Friedman who played this character on there in the early 70s called Easy Reader. And he was like this jive talking like book cop or something. I don't know. I, but like they had his stamp on there and it was always like easy reader says this book is easy to read. And I thought that is so 70s. I want to put Fritz there. I want to recreate that and put that on Lost Grooves and put Fritz on it. So like I called him and I got this voicemail and I wasn't even sure it was him. So I explained what I was doing and that I would mail him like examples of what I was doing with this with this stamp. So I mailed it to, you know, Frederick Perrinboom in Westerville. And I come home like two or three weeks later and like there's a voicemail on my phone from Fritz. But like he's in character. So like it's not oh hey, it's Frederick Perrinboom. It's like, uh hey Jeff, this is Fritz the Night Owl. You know, and he goes through the whole spiel, like your voice of the night. And like and he tells me what to, what to say. Like he thought the idea was so great and he knew the Electric Company comics and like he gave me the copy to put on it. So not only did he give me the stamp of approval, but he like wrote the sentence that went in the, uh, that went in the thing. And it was a real like uh, nondescript sentence about how like, you know, this comic book has staples, which makes it easier to read, which was total Fritz and Night Owl. Gray Barker's The Silver Bridge. Has anybody read that? That is the weirdest book that like I just want to see if anybody liked it like I'm like one chapter is like research and then one chapter is like this fictional narrative and like I read it once and I'm like I, I don't get this and then uh, I discovered it was on audible uh, and was listening to it coming down this weekend and I'm like man this thing might suck I can't tell like it, it's just so weird but if you it's good I mean I, I recommend it if you ever want to uh, download the audio, but uh, there are so many mispronunciations. Uh, I don't know who was overseeing the recording of this, but uh, what was the the big one was uh, Gallipolis is mentioned like, and then it's mentioned like three times, and then they even go so far as to say Gallipolis Ferry, and I'm like, how is that Gallipolis? Like, how could you not look that up? That's kind of a you're offending an entire town. I call it Gallipolis, but if you can get past that, uh, the audio is pretty well done, but it's a strange book. I think maybe where I was, had looked forward to reading it for so long that once when I got to it, I'm like, ugh, uh, what is this? Like, but it was good to like, if you're, if you're a fan of Keel's Mothman Prophecies, it's a, it's a good counterpoint to it. Because um, there's some contradictions in there that, you know, Gray was, might have been messing with Keel a little bit, and Keel might have not really taken Gray so seriously, so it's, it's fun to go through, but I wasn't expecting the uh, the odd uh, homoerotic narrative throughout the. It's a strange book. It's a strange book. So I was just curious if anybody had read it. Has anybody read Visitors from Lanulos? Out of curiosity. Yeah. Did you Did you like it? For its time period, the reference. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of dug it. I mean, it was like. It was out there though. Yeah. Like it. I, I was like, I was really into it a few years ago and was trying to get the rights to it to adapt it to a graphic novel, but there's really not a, there's really not an arc in it anywhere. There's really not a story. It's just, it's just these, these abductions. But yeah, it's a trippy book. I love it. Yeah. I remember a guy from Arizona or something who claimed the same thing, but after, you know, where they went to the city of, with the naked people and all that. Right. Right. He claimed the same thing later. I don't know if he was taking Right. 
Yeah, it's interesting stuff. And I always love on these, I always love the idea on these uh, UFO abduction stories about how, like, the UFOs all have, like, 60s technology in the UFOs. Like, it's all the giant light bulb, that's their controller panels, and, like, they have, like, bunk beds and, like, wood stoves in the, <laughs> in the spaceship. But then, like, Gray Barker in Silver Bridge was talking about that, and he's like, well, you know, it would have that if these were man-made ships, or these were experimental aircraft, which is one of the theories, which I hadn't really thought about that, so that's kind of interesting, too. But I just love reading this stuff, especially if it's, you know, halfway well-written. So that's my questions. If you guys don't have anything, we'll, uh, we'll give you 25 minutes back in your day. So everybody enjoy the festival, and I uh, hope I'll see you out there before it rains again. Thanks a lot. With his red eyes aglow, and his white wings spread wide, you are helpless below, looking up to the night. Is he chief cold storms go, or an alien on the shores of the Ohio, or here in West Virginia? Pointless unbelief beneath the shadow ideas of number one and all. No rest here between the mountains and the meadow in no is supernatural. Oh no. And watch out, the mob man will steal you away. Oh, watch out, or oh, maybe he'll save the day. Yeah.